Thank you very much, and I really appreciate being invited to come and address this very important group assembled here on an incredibly august occasion, which is the 100th anniversary of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Uh, congratulations to all of Brazil on uh, meeting this important milestone. So the reason I chose uh, this topic is that, as you just heard, in uh, less than two months, I will be assuming the position of the president of the U.S. Academy of Sciences. And one of the uh, initiatives that I will have when I assume that position is to try to make the U.S. Academy more international in its outlook. Uh, as many of you might know, the U.S. Academy of Sciences is uh, the only academy that I know of that was actually chartered to provide advice to its government. It is actually written in the charter that the U.S. Academy of Sciences is supposed to, when asked, provide advice to the government of the United States on important matters. And I think that we do not often enough involve our international scientific colleagues when we provide that advice. And I think that we need to do that more often because it's hard for me to think that there has been a matter upon which we have been asked to provide advice that isn't a matter that is international in its scope. Because if it isn't a problem that has uh, already uh, happened to someone else already, it's going to happen to someone else soon. And so we need to be talking about these issues on an international stage. We need to be learning from others, and we need to share our experience with others. And so for my presentation today, I wanted to discuss fighting international threats with international science. And um, talk, because I, I can't talk about all science in just the time I have today, talk about mostly emergencies that we face. Um, because as you heard, while I was director of the USGS, um, I'm sure it was entirely due to just random chance, the US faced an unprecedented number of crises. And as soon as I stepped down from USGS, all the crises stopped. But anyway, so I'm going to uh, go over some of those crises and how science was used to address them and how science could have done a better job had we had more science and in many cases, more international science to draw upon. So let me start by saying that crises are a growth industry. For any young people who might be sitting here today, if you're thinking about what you might want to do with science, go into crisis science, because there's no shortage of crises that are happening. More people are living in harm's way. That's the first thing. And climate change can exacerbate some of these threats. So the threats are even increasing in their severity. And as economies expand worldwide, the economic toll of those disasters mount. So all of the people of the world are saying, hey, politicians, hey, scientists, we've got to stop these disasters. What used to be a disaster that didn't amount to much is now a big dollar problem because it's not just a matter where people pick up a few tents and move out of the way. It's now a, a whole community that finds themselves paying big bucks when they get flooded out. So disasters are a growth industry and science can actually help. Now, science can help in a number of ways, and I'm going to list 
at least five ways, and I'm sure all of you smart people out here can think of even more ways that science can help. So here's just my little back of the envelope list of ways that science can help. Well, first of all, science can forecast the likely locations and frequency of various threats. That is, who's going to be at risk? We can say, where are earthquakes going to happen? And is this a zone that's going to have an earthquake every you know, 100 years or every 1,000 years? Is this an area that's going to flood every 10 years or every 100 years? We can predict with greater certainty the timing and intensity of various disasters. So we can provide warnings and emergency assistance. For example, a good, good example of that are things like hurricanes. We can tell people, um, give them a warning that a hurricane's on its way. This is the zone where the hurricane is likely to make landfall, and you've got three days to get out of the way. Um, and we can also, uh, for uh, many disasters, um, uh, tell uh, people, um, uh, for example, I'll give an example from earthquakes, um, what were the likely casualties and uh, what were the likely economic losses when they happened in remote areas and help scale the disaster assistance. A third way is we can deliver what I'll call actionable science to decision makers during emergencies to help end the crisis. And this is so important in so many of the health emergencies we've seen. How can people get in and actually make the emergency go away? What kind of actions will help? What kind of actions are not helpful? And that's really important when decision makers are saying, I don't know what to do. We saw this during the oil spill. Is dispersant going to help? Is dispersant going to make it worse? Science can help um, people understand the factors that increase or reduce the frequency and intensity of disasters so that they can help mitigate. Now, some disasters we can't actually mitigate. For example, let me give you a, a good example. Earthquakes that occur because of plates moving around on the Earth, we're not going to stop plate tectonics. That we can't do. But earthquakes that occur because of unconventional oil extraction, we can. So science can help drillers understand, and people who are disposing of wastewater from drilling can help them understand why it is that Oklahoma has replaced California as the earthquake capital of the United States? And how can we stop earthquakes from occurring in Oklahoma and rattling the citizens of that state? And so we can actually mitigate man-made earthquakes in a way we, that we can't mitigate natural earthquakes. And finally, we can help people understand how they can reduce their risk of falling victim to hazards. So we can build resiliency. So even those, earth, those, those natural hazards that we can't stop, we can at least help people not be victims to them. So that's very important. Even if there is a flu going around, uh, maybe we can't stop the flu from starting, but we can help people understand what are risky behaviors that will um, increase your chances of getting the flu, and what are good solutions to make sure that you're not a victim of the flu. So um, I'm going to go through now some examples of ways in which scientists uh, can be helpful and ways in which international science um, can be more helpful in some uh, examples of uh, crises where we maybe didn't have all the science that we could have had. So let me stop, start with the first one, 
forecasting the likely locations and frequency of various threats, uh, understanding who's at risk. And the example uh, I wanted to give, I want to give from one of the first, um, uh, one of the first uh, disasters I had to deal with when I was USGS director uh, was this one. Uh, the eruption of Ayafiatlayukul, which is uh, an Icelandic volcano that erupted on March 20th, uh, 2010. It began its eruption on that day. The eruption of this volcano was um, uh, resulted in the largest disruption to air traffic ever since World War II. It shut down the aircraft industry such that the aircraft industry alone lost a billion dollars in just six days. And that loss in income to the aircraft industry was just the tip of the iceberg because there were cascading consequences to other industries as well. For example, my son-in-law is from Kenya. And I learned as a result of this that one of the agricultural exports from Kenya is fresh cut flowers. And those flowers all have to be exported from Kenya to markets elsewhere in the world by air freight. And when the airplanes were grounded, all those flowers sat in the hot sun on the tarmac in Nairobi, and none of them could get out of Kenya, out of Nairobi. And six days is too long for fresh cut flowers to sit. And so they all rotted, and the farmers in Kenya lost a week's worth of income because of this volcano. Now, how could science have helped? Now, the grounding of the planes for six days was out of an abundance of caution because aircraft engineers don't actually know the precise tolerance for each different aircraft engine for the particles that come out of in a volcanic eruption of this sort and how much soot from the eruption they can ingest in their aircraft engines before they lose power. They know at some level, yes, because it's happened, um, airplanes fall out of the sky. But they don't know after day one can they fly, after day two can they fly, after day three can they fly, after day four can they fly, after day five can they fly. And it turns out that the countries where most of the volcano experts are, are not the same countries where the aircraft engineers are. And those communities had never gotten together to work out the specifics of the tolerances of the aircraft engineers to the particles from these volcanic eruptions. And so everyone played it very, very safe. So this is something where international science, people working across borders, perhaps could have gotten those planes in the air a little sooner. So let me go to the next topic here. Predicting with greater certainty the timing and intensity of various disasters in order to provide warnings and emergency assistance. So one example I want to give here, um, this is a picture of the uh, New Jersey seashore after Superstorm Sandy. That was another disaster that happened on my watch. It was October 25th, uh, 2012. This was, uh, in terms of economic impact, um, a, a costly disaster, $75 billion, uh, because this um, uh, hurricane hit a glancing blow along the east coast of the US. It was second only to um, Katrina 
in economic damages. But the deaths from this storm were remarkably low because the National Weather Service did a fabulous job of warning everyone and had a spot on forecast of exactly where the storm was going to go. Everyone knew with three days warning where the storm was going to go and everyone could get out of the way. No one really had an excuse for being caught in this storm's path. But what was unusual about the storm and the reason why the economic um, uh, losses were so big was that this storm was thought to have reached unusual intensity because of a um, ice-free Arctic, which might have fed unusual um, energy into this storm, which caused uh, high economic losses. Just one year later from Sandy, another super hurricane, this one Super Typhoon Haiyan, uh, also known Super Typhoon Yolanda. This one was the strongest cyclone ever recorded to hit the Philippines. 6,300 people died in this uh, typhoon. And you wonder, how could everyone get out of the way for Sandy? and more than 6,000 people die in the Philippines. Where were the warnings? Where was the evacuation for this typhoon? Could there not have been more, you know, we knew with Sandy about the increased, because of climate change, the increased um, uh, power in Sandy and um, Yolanda was again a climate change um, a hyped uh, storm and couldn't something more have been done for the people of the Philippines to save lives in that case. And I think this shows something else that we need to be taking into account with science is the fact that the baseline is changing. Science that might have been really good and serving us well is going to have a changing baseline because things are not the way they always were. Um, the uh, climate change is shifting baselines and science has to evolve with it. And we need to work across international boundaries to keep our science up to date. So um, let me get to the third topic here. Delivering actionable science to decision makers during emergencies to help end the crisis. So during my time at the um, so USGS, perhaps um, one of the things that we worked hardest on was delivering actionable science in the case of earthquakes. And this is an example of one of those tools. It's called PAGER. And PAGER stands for, um, well, I can't remember, but it's um, a preliminary uh, estimate of uh, earthquake response. And this, uh, within minutes of an earthquake, the people at the USGS send um, the pager results to embassies, to uh, the State Department, to uh, consulates, to decision makers around the globe. And this is just the pager result for a recent earthquake in Ecuador that happened uh, last week, I believe it was. And it shows on the left estimated fatalities and on the right estimated economic losses. And um, it shows in this case that the estimated fatalities were going to be between 100 and 1,000 deaths. 
and the estimated uh, economic losses were going to be between 100 million and a billion dollars for that earthquake. And the purpose of sending this information out is to help emergency responders know, is this going to be an earthquake that can be handled with a local response, a regional response, a national response, or an international response? And that helps the um, leaders of the country know, do we need to invite in international um, relief workers immediately, or can we handle this on our own? Do we need to dispatch our National Guard to the region right away, or will the regional uh, people be able to handle it? And um, this we, we know from talking to people who have responded to this has saved lives by getting the right level of response um, to the area in a timely manner. A case where um, I believe international cooperation um, could have helped more was um, this uh, emergency. Uh, this was Deepwater Horizon, and of all of the uh, crises that happened during my time at the USGS, this is the one that uh, took um, most of my time and engaged me the most. Uh, within days of uh, this rig um, losing well control, I was dispatched to BP headquarters in Houston, and I spent the next three to four months down there uh, working with the scientists and engineers at BP to help bring the well under control and to try to uh, estimate the flow rate. Um, during this time, of course, it became the largest marine oil spill in US history. 11 men died on this rig, and it was an environmental disaster. One thing that we really um, needed during this time were analogies. How are we going to control the well? How are we going to estimate the flow rate? Because it turns out that intervention into this well to bring it under control really depended on knowing how fast the oil was coming out of the well. There were some early methods of intervention that BP attempted that failed because the flow rate was too high. Had we known in the beginning that the flow rate was that high, BP probably would not have even wasted time on those intervention methods. The coffer dam um, and the, um, uh, the um, uh, trying to kill the well from above with um, the um, uh, mud injection from above. Now, it turns out that 30 years before, there had been another blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the Ixtoc One well. And this was also uh, a marine um, blowout that was in 1979. And yet, um, there was absolutely no information available from this blowout. There had been no scientific reports. There had been no papers written. And from what we could tell, there were actually, um, scientists had been discouraged from actually being involved in this well blowout. So this was a case where um, scientists having been involved in this could have been a huge boon to fighting the Deepwater Horizon uh, blowout. There was a, an estimate of the rate at which the um, oil was leaking from its stock, but no information as to how that flow rate was ever estimated, and no publications on it. So again, international science could have really helped bringing uh, deep water uh, horizon under control and with the estimated flow rate, but none was available. 
Okay, let me go to the fourth. Understand the factors that increase or reduce the frequency and intensity of disasters in order to mitigate um, our, um, uh, our, our risk. Uh, there's already been a lot of mention about uh, the Ebola crisis. In the 2015 crisis, uh, the estimates are easily that 11,000 people died from Ebola in um, that, uh, that, that one um, uh, crisis. Scientists, the scientific community en masse, rose up to um, uh, complain about the lack of international cooperation during that crisis. Because clinical and lab data during that time were collected from over 2,000 patients, and there were tens of thousands of patient specimens collected, but there were no agreements for, um, uh, that uh, allowed for data standardization, for data sharing, or for data access. And that very much limited the ability for scientists to work together to figure out um, ultimately, and particularly during the crisis, how it could be mitigated and um, to come up with also actionable science uh, during the crisis. And it was because of the experience with Ebola that uh, scientists decided to work together better during Zika. And uh, in the upper right-hand corner is just a little cutout from um, a recent publication that was um, published jointly in uh, Science and Nature. And it um, is a pledge that scientists are going to share uh, samples, uh, data, and information um, in the current um, Zika crisis. And in this case, um, uh, some of the journals that have agreed to this are Science, Nature, eLife, the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, PLOS. A number of academies have signed on to this. Um, the Finnish Academy, um, the Royal Society, um, uh, the Chinese Academy, the US Academy, um, and in addition, this was all um, started by a number of funding agencies, such as uh, the Wellcome Trust, uh, the uh, NIH, uh, and a number of other major funding agencies um, to make sure that um, everyone is working together and sharing samples such that um, people are not um, uh, not uh, holding back science because um, they can't get access to important information that can uh, move things forward as quickly as possible. Okay, so, um, and then finally, um, help people understand how they can reduce the risk of falling victim um, to hazards and um, build uh, resiliency. And this is particularly important in cases where we actually uh, can't um, mitigate. We can't, you know, perhaps um, uh, bioengineer the mosquitoes such that uh, we can actually stop the transmission. There are um, many, um, uh, there, are, there are many, many hazards that we can't actually stop. But what we can do is say, the hazards are all around us, but we can stop ourselves from becoming victims. And um, here's, here's a, a, a perfect case. Uh, this was actually the very first um, disaster that happened on my watch at the USGS. This was the um, January 12th, 2010 Haiti earthquake. More than 200,000 people died in this earthquake. It was a magnitude seven earthquake. Magnitude seven earthquakes happen in the US, in Japan, 
in Chile all the time. When they happen in those countries that have done a good job of um, resilience building, there was, a, for example, there was a magnitude 7 earthquake in the US um, back in the um, late 1980s. 60 people died. 200,000 people died from the same earthquake. And in fact, several months after this earthquake, there was a much larger earthquake in Chile. And about 60 people died. So when countries are re resilient in terms of their infrastructure, large numbers, they don't have to turn into these human tragedies. And so this is actually a tragedy of poverty, that um, the, the, the country is so busy fighting um, problems of education, problems of trying to feed its people, problems of health care, that building homes that don't collapse in earthquakes are just not high on its on its list of priorities. And so, um, you know, a, a previous speaker uh, today talked about the problem of inequality. And this is uh, a case in, in point of what happens when we have large um, issues of inequality and then a disaster strikes. And then we see the large difference in death toll because we can't build resiliency into this population, or at least it hasn't been built. Now, we even saw, though, um, this is uh, another example um, of where international uh, science can help, though. This was the March 11, 2011 Japan earthquake. This brings another point, though, of international uh, cooperation because Japan is one of the most earthquake resilient countries in the world. It has every home and building is earthquake resilient. It has an earthquake warning system that worked perfectly. <coughs> Estimates are that for this monster magnitude nine earthquake, one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded since instruments began, that the death toll from this large earthquake was maybe, maybe less than 100 people, minor for the size earthquake it was. But yet, 16,000 people died because of the tsunami. And then, of course, in the aftermath of that, they had the nuclear reactor meltdown. And I pose to you all, as an international group, we have to think more now about disasters not as onesies, but as onesies, twosies, and threesies, where disasters are not going to happen alone, but they are going to have cascading consequences. And we have to start thinking about what happens when one disaster triggers another disaster, triggers a third disaster, and how we get scientists to start working across disciplinary boundaries to think about not what's the probability of one disaster happening, but what's the probability when one disaster happens and the coupled probability then of another and a third. So what happens when a drought leads to a war that leads to a mass migration that then leads to more civil unrest? These are the kinds of things that we have to be worrying about as a society because I think those are the real issues that we're going to have to confront. 
and we have to confront them as an international group of scientists. That's what's, those are the real hazards that we're going to be facing. And then there are the ones that are happening where we didn't expect them to happen at all. This is from New Zealand. Um, this is from uh, a town called Canterbury, where uh, this cathedral had been standing for a long time and was knocked down in uh, an earthquake, the third deadliest disaster in um, New Zealand's history on the 22nd of February in um, 2011. And then um, I, it was just six months later that it happened in Washington, D.C., the National Cathedral. Um, the spires came down. Who would ever have expected an earthquake in Washington, D.C.? I think with that, you almost can expect one in Rio. So um, anyway, uh, I, I think that, that these points are that disasters can happen just about everywhere. And as an international community, we have to be prepared for them. So what should we be doing? Well, first of all, as I say, there's no shortage of emergencies. Oil spills, earthquakes, hurricanes, pandemics, even terrorist attacks. This, I have a little picture from the USGS that after 9-11, um, we threw, flew LIDAR over um, the site of the um, collapsed buildings just to measure you know, how thick the rubble was, and then went back over multispectral imaging um, to look at the toxics. Um, how much asbestos is there and other uh, toxics in there so that emergency workers could get in? All sorts of ways scientists can help, even in um, terrorist attacks. For those of you who haven't um, heard it, um, you should hear Rita Caldwell's uh, description of how scientists help um, find the um, terrorist who was using anthrax to um, uh, terrorize um, congressmen in the US and how they were able to trace exactly who the terrorist was based on the genetic code of the exact anthrax that was being used. It's an amazing story. So scientists can help even terrorist attacks. So now let me just quickly go through what the solutions are so that we can behave as an international community. First of all, we need international education. I'm a huge fan of sending our students abroad. We need to send more Americans to your universities. You already send your students to our universities. But um, I, I, I sent my daughters abroad, and you need to keep sending your students to our universities as well. Um, we need international collaborations. We need to convince all of our funding agencies the importance of uh, sending our researchers um, to work in um, foreign labs. We're finding more and more of the papers that we publish in science have international groups of co-authors. I was in a foreign country, I won't say the name yet because I don't want to embarrass anyone, and um, the um, scientists in this foreign country were saying, you don't publish enough of our papers in the journal Science. And I said to them, well, you know, I've been walking around to all the labs in um, you know, your universities, and all the people I see in your labs are only from your country, and they're only educated in your country. And most of the papers that we're publishing in science now all have international groups of co-authors. So I think there's a correlation here. Um, we need all of the nations need to provide more opportunities for junior researchers. I, I can hardly name a single country that's really doing a good job of providing opportunities for its junior researchers. Young scientists everywhere are being discouraged by a lack of opportunities. They've got fresh ideas. They have international outlooks. I believe strongly that merit should be the primary criteria for access to research sources, 
not seniority, and we aren't doing a good job of providing those opportunities for our young people. And we don't want them to be leaving science after we've spent a long time training them. So we've got to find more opportunities for them. We need diverse teams tackling these complex problems that I was just telling you about. And studies show that the performance of an organization increases with its degree of diversity. You go to the top organizations in the US, places like Google and Apple, and it's just like a UN when you walk in there. And um, it's got um, women and young people and old people and uh, people from uh, all races. We can't afford to squander scientific talent by not um, being welcoming to everyone um, of all uh, genders, ages, creeds, everyone. And we have to practice impeccable ethics. Um, and uh, by doing that, we have to stick to the facts, we have to avoid bias, and scientists can't be part of the solution if they are part of the problem. Journals have very strict ethical guidelines and we are um, not afraid to uh, impose sanctions on authors that violate our ethical guidelines. Um, so anyway, uh, enough said. Um, and never let, uh, a rule here, never let incomplete knowledge be an excuse for inaction. We should be striving for no regrets actions based on our best available information. And as a dire warning here, I just uh, plot here, this is years from 1958 to 2003, life expectancy in a number of African countries, where life expectancy started here between 40 and 50 and was gradually rising and then it started falling off, first in Uganda, then in Botswana, then in Zimbabwe, and in Kenya, and in South Africa. And in every single one of those countries, life expectancy was falling off because people were saying, oh, we're not absolutely positive that HIV causes AIDS. OK, so again. Never let incomplete knowledge be an excuse for inaction. There were all sorts of things that could have been done to stop that from happening. All right. Again, along the lines of solutions, uh, we published in Science a paper on promoting, oops, oh, too bad, I'm going too fast. Um, we published a paper in Science on um, promoting an open research culture um, that uh, has uh, guidelines called the top guidelines um, that has standards uh, for um, that science and uh, more than 500 journals are now uh, taking on for um, citation standards, uh, open data practices, uh, open sample practices, um, uh, for showing all your work and um, for um, showing your methods, et cetera. Um, and uh, we're really encouraging everyone to take a look at those standards and follow them. So finally, just in closing, um, I think many of you know that during the Ebola crisis, how much um, there were groups such as uh, Médecins Sans Frontières um, that really stepped up and were heroes. Um, they didn't care where the borders of the countries were. They didn't care who needed help. All they knew was that there was a crisis and that they would step in and do what was necessary to solve the problem. So in closing, I just want to say, I think it's time that we build scientists without borders. Scientists can be part of the solution, and all of us should consider ourselves scientists without borders and use our skills to solve this growing number of complicated problems because the world needs us. So thank you all very much, 
and I'm happy to take questions. So, uh, since we are too late, we have time for two, no more than three questions. I'm sorry about that. Okay, all right. Yeah, third English, I don't need this. Okay. Uh, thank you for such a, an interesting and important lecture. Um, I'm sorry I'm going to divert a little bit, but I want to ask you a question. Uh, my definition of underdevelopment is that it's a place where life is worth zero. And... Uh, in many of the examples that you gave, like this comparing the Katrina, no, sorry, the Sandy and the Yolanda uh, accident, uh, one country was quite very developed, and the other one was an underdeveloped one. And at that, and other examples you mentioned uh, were the same. Uh, when you mentioned that example, I recalled. Uh, something that happened in Brazil, in Angra dos Reis, which is a city, very beautiful uh, seaside city near Rio. Uh, what, we had some f um, floods and thousands of people died. And at the same time, there were floods in Austra Australia and uh, nobody died, or maybe just a few people, just as an example. I, I wanted to ask you, without willing to embarrass you, uh, how would you consider the role, I quite agree that we should be a community without borders, but what would be the role of governments to make a difference? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that's a really good question. Um, so one, one problem that we have um, just for example, in the United States, is trying to prevent development in areas where people probably shouldn't be um, living. Uh, and, um, you know, for example, um, if there is uh, an area that is flooding every hundred years, is that enough of a reason not to live there? Probably not. But if there is a, a place where a hurricane comes through every um, 50 years, what is the role of the government to get people out of there regardless of their economic conditions? I, I'm, I, per, I personally get really upset when I hear your story that um, that, that people are dying because of their economic status. Why aren't people not being evacuated regardless of what their economic status is? I, I, think, I think that that is the role of the government, right? It should be. Okay. So there is another question hand up there. Hi, Marcia. You said something about the importance of having a science here in Brazil that's really international when you talked about having researchers and students from other countries. You haven't said the name of the other country, but I'm pretty sure we could talk about Brazil. So what well, do you it, it actually wasn't Brazil, but it might be okay, Brazil, yeah. I don't know. We could, we could uh, like have the same problem here. So in your opinion, what is the best thing we could do? Like, should we teach in English in our universities? 
Should we have international professors? Should we accept more international students? Should we be more involved with whatever is being done in, in the international science? Or should we look more into the problems we have here in our country? So what are your ideas about this um, internationalization, let's say, of the science? OK, well, first of all, I think all of those ideas you had were good ones. Um, I think that having international students um, is a great one because just the diversity of thinking you get, whether they're other um, South American students, whether they're from Africa, whether they're from um, Asia, whether they're from um, Europe, whether they're from um, elsewhere in the Americas, I think they enrich your thinking, they enrich your discussions, um, they uh, give you opportunities. There, I think there um, is still an advantage to knowing English because so many papers are published in English, in English-speaking journals um, that, uh, you know, the, um, it's, it's become de facto a um, language where a lot of communication happens. So I think that's another, um, uh, it, it's another advantage that can set you apart. I can imagine that you are thinking a lot about when you assume the presidency of the Academy of Science. A lot of academies in the world have to confront uh, governments that are very adverse to the scientific community and to the strategies uh, proposed by the scientific community. What are your thoughts about this and your meditations about how you could confront this in the United States? Right. Um, this is a, a particularly acute problem in the United States um, where we find that science is becoming increasingly politicized, um, which is uh, e exceptionally uh, unfortunate because uh, I, I don't think that's necessary and, and I don't think it should be. Um, my approach when I was director of the USGS was to um, take a lot of time to talk to people of both parties and to, um, in particular, make sure that they understand that science is not political, that there are so many issues um, of science where it has um, contributed to the health and welfare of uh, people, um, to their uh, safety, to the economy, um, to human well-being. Um, and it's, it, there never was a situation where if I didn't do a lot of homework on um, a person that I couldn't find science that they cared about because science had contributed to something that mattered to them. Um, it was, you know, no matter how much they may dislike climate change or how much they might dislike conservation or how much they might dislike something or another, there were always whole fields of science that were important to them. And all you have to do is talk to them about that, and, and they love you. So, you know. Yeah. So, OK, Maurice, the last <laughs> quick question. Thank you very much, Deborah. I'm Maurice Ruggedis. Uh As already said, uh, many of the examples you mentioned are related to, to the lack of access to science and to knowledge. Mm -hmm. not exactly uh, to the lack of uh, uh, knowledge available in the world. 
My question is not related to the government, but how do you think the uh, national academies of sciences should face the problem of access to the science and technology available to the society? Okay. Um, okay, so that's, that's a really good question. Uh, I think a lot of this is um, uh, happening. There's going to be a new um, study that's going to be happening that the Academy will be taking the lead on that will be in conjunction with journals and funding agencies that will be talking about um, what the policies should be on um, data access, sample access. Um, you know, we, we only can really uh, talk about things that um, come out of our funding agencies and that happen when things are published in journals that agree to policies that have um, been, um, you know, vetted um, in conjunction with um, our funding agencies. But still, that's quite a few journals. I think um, the biggest, um, the biggest lever right now is actually the fact that the journals are pushing for this. Um, so sometimes a lot of people think that's not fast enough because some people don't want to wait until things come out in the journals. Um, and so um, the funding agencies are, are saying um, things need to be deposited, data needs to be deposited as soon as it's collected, but not all funding agencies are saying that. The journals are saying that it needs to be deposited as soon as it's published. Um, some scientists are saying that's not fast enough, but at least it's better than it was. Um, the, uh, you know, with, with, with Zika, we're, we're pushing for um, everything immediate because it's a crisis. Not all things are as, an, as immediate a crisis as Zika, but I think we'll take things like that on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's thanks again, Marsha, for an excellent talk.